Ladies and gentlemen, all my demonic slaying unicorns, I bring you today's gameplay feature on Pex Plays Diablo 2 Resurrected. So please, won't you stay a while and listen. The Diablo series is over two decades old and one of Blizzard Entertainment's crowning achievements as one of its flagship offerings. It is an RPG hack and slash which countless other games have been inspired by. Diablo 2 was released into the world in June 2000 and took the world by storm since. I found myself logging in and out randomly over the years, playing a little bit here and there after my addiction in the early 2000s. Always coming back to the slaughter for a few hours and picking up some fat loots on top of it. I have lost the will to grind over the years in games like this, but there was always something special about Diablo 2, something which lured me back. Maybe I too was possessed by Diablo, and his voice gripped me, calling me back, always calling me back. The battle between the heavens and hells raged once more in September 2021, when its remaster brought that nostalgic golden era overdose to myself and millions of others worldwide who craved it. But alas, upon its release, I was in the middle of moving cities and then moving between apartments, so my excitement had to hold just a little bit longer until the frozen winter set in and just like myself, venturing through the Snowy Norts again of the Diablo 2 expansion, Lord of Destruction. So join me as I dive back into the world of Sanctuary and introduce myself to a brief overview of its plot and history, its core gameplay mechanics, features and design, and finally, my opinions and verdict, does Diablo 2 Resurrected still hold up to its original after two decades, two decades. So I ask you once more to stay a while and listen. <laughs> okay, geez, Kane, you had your time. You had your time. It's my turn. Rest in peace, old man. Oh shit. <laughs> oh shit, Diablo Tree spoilers. <laughs> But we won't talk about that game. Oh no, we won't. <laughs> From humbling beginnings set in the tragic town of Tristram. Try say that ten times really fast. Tragic town of Tristram, tragic town of Tristram, tragic town of Tristram. <laughs> It's a tongue twister. The first outing in the Diablo universe, it's focused its entire story delving under the cathedral in search of the young Prince Albrecht, whom had been captured by a corrupted Archbishop Lazarus. Upon banishing Lazarus and ultimately killing the Lord of Terror Diablo himself, afterwards we removed a soul stone from Diablo's corpse. These soul stones were used to imprison Diablo and his older brothers, Baal and Mephisto. Upon removing the soul stone, Diablo's corpse disintegrates and we find the body of the young prince that all was remaining beneath Diablo's carapace. We, as the protagonist, had no choice but to imprison Diablo again by piercing our own forehead to contain him within ourselves. We hoped we would be strong enough to keep his evil essence at bay, but we knew he was clawing away at our soul. From that day, from a game solely focused on that one town of Tristram, the sequel knew it had to go bolder and deeper. Building on from its predecessor, we are introduced to one of the most greatest games of all time. In the sequel, we are in the shadow of the Dark Wanderer and span the land of Sanctuary in search for him. For he is to be the one who imprisoned Diablo in the original game. That's right, 
Our villain of this story was the hero from the previous. While we search for this dark wanderer, we are brought not only back to Tristram and its surrounding lands, but also set sail to the distant desert of Lutgolain in search of the true tomb of the sorcerer Tal Rasha. From there, we visit the jungle regions of Kurost, take on the council before taking a portal to step into the burning hells itself, and finally end up north in the barbarian highlands, where we take our last stand in Haragath and battle our way through Mount Ariet to the World Stone. This time we face all three primevals, Diablo, Mephisto and Bale, all of whom are introduced through beautiful cinematics involving the curious narrator of Marius, the lone survivor of a tavern set ablaze by Diablo in the beginning of the story. Marius is compelled to follow the Dark Wanderer, just as you do in your adventure, and while we watch Diablo free his imprisoned brothers through the eyes of Marius, it is up to us ultimately to set them all to rest and destroy their soul stones. As any other demonic force tries to get in our way, and yes, we are battling the hordes of hell, no doubt, so there are many, many slain foes in our wake of destruction. Our objective as the hero in this tale is simple, yet achieving it will be difficult. We must battle each of the three primevals, retrieve their soul stones, destroy them so they never again will sow hatred, wreak terror, or bring destruction across the land of Sanctuary. Diablo is all about the gameplay and dark gothic aesthetic. These core aspects are what drew fans across the globe in the beginning, the latter in particular being sorely missed in Diablo 3. But once again, we won't talk about that one. Vicarious Visions headed up this remaster and you can see from the graphics alone that they held such a profound respect and reverence for keeping that atmosphere as close to the original intact. How do you remember the graphics of Diablo 2 might you ask? In your mind they probably are what you see right now. But wait up, this is what they looked like. Our brains filled in the gaps where computers could not. Our brains built the world even deeper than the darkest depths Diablo had to offer. The fact that you can toggle instantaneously between the original graphics and the remaster is a feature they did not need to include, but included it anyway, allowing fans new and veteran alike, if they so wish, to play whichever graphical format they desired. And I think that is something truly special. Switching between each of the environments, it is a truly a feast for the eyes. Truly. The amount of love and nurture the team gave to this game. We can see additional clutter on the ground and walls, additional foliage, all because this game can handle it, trying to further commit to the immersion. Albeit, none of this may be game changing, but it draws you in as you follow the path of the Dark Wanderer throughout Sanctuary. When traveling through the darkest tunnels, tombs and catacombs throughout Sanctuary, the original Diablo 2 wanted you to feel like you were trapped in the dark, offering limited lighting from sentry bonfires and torches. Your character emitted a small light radius, as did enemies, and so did attacks such as spells and projectiles. They wanted you to feel alone, and you never knew what was awaiting. You may see glimpses of the enemy on screen and see them wander off, scarcely lit, just enough for your eyes to see before they vanished. This created a sense of not only curiosity, but dread. Who knew what else was tagged along with that of which you saw? It's phenomenal that the remaster recaptures this effect and keeps that spotlight of the attention the original demanded. Along with the environments and lighting enhancements, of course, character models and creature models are detail rich. The remaster did not need to introduce new enemies or attacks to keep it interesting. Diablo 2 got the jab done. <laughs> got the jab done. <laughs> 
Diablo 2 got the job done back then, and it still does now. Even if we are used to a lot more spectacle and variety in modern day games. The drawback to all this additional flair on our screens is the off chance we may miss some valuable loot as items may not appear as obvious. Of course we can toggle this feature on and off, but they don't seem to pop like they once did. I find myself constantly holding down the alt key or toggling the alt key on and off after I kill a group of enemies to make sure I did not miss anything valuable as that brings up the item text on the screen. One thing I did appreciate in Diablo 3 is that they added a glow of importance to the items. Not only the sound, which may be missed. And yes guys, damn it. I mentioned it after we said we won't talk about it. Please. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what keeps players playing long after the main story is over in RPGs? And action RPGs even. The chance to increase your character's power potential. Diablo is all about the loot drops. But those loot drops don't come easy and certainly don't come fast. A stark comparison which is ingrained in the modern day looter is that the game wants you to feel powerful within the opening hours. Diablo slowly hands you marginal power increases in its items. You could keep the same main hand for the entire act or longer if not lucky or if the merchants don't have anything special in their wares. Completing quests very rarely offers you a reward and generally acts as a way to guide you, uh, to help you explore the game, rather than here, here you go, here's another reward, do this, here's another reward. Thankfully, Vicarious Visions kept this sense of exploration in the game, not only through the lighting as discussed earlier, whereby we slowly pushed through each room to advance on the map or run blindly, <laughs> which I do a lot, but the quests don't use a navigational system to tell you where on the map the quest location is. They leave it in the capable brains of its players to figure that out, only offering you the area name or dungeon name as guidance. After you eventually finish normal mode, you can replay the game through Nightmare, and upon completing that, hell, or stick to farming the mode of your choice until you feel ready or go back and forth between. Each difficulty rebalances the monster's stats and how powerful the loot will be. The game itself will essentially play out the exact same, but since the game maps and creatures therein are always generated on a game per game basis, does it really ever play out the exact same? Each mode will test your character and some enemies, which did not seem so deadly, may become just that. I will go through these game modes specifically later. There are 10 item slots available, so that's up to 10 slots where you may have the urge to farm out until your character is at its strongest. But within this, you will most likely change in and out different equipment depending on the challenge you will face next, or even a change in character build. Inventory management has always been a staple of the Diablo games, and you will find it very, very quickly. All those squares in your bag will fill fast. This can be slightly offset by wearing a larger belt where you can hold your potions. And trust me, you will be chugging potions. Holding any charms, which help increase your stats as well, will take up inventory slots anywhere between one to three squares. And these uh, useful effects are only activated as long as you hold them in your inventory. Most likely you will find yourself holding a Book of Town portal also, which could already mean your available inventory space will be severely limited. 
You may find yourself sorting through items to allow you to carry that extra weapon so you can sell it, because gold can be extremely important in this game to buy new shiny upgrades from merchants, or refresh your potion stock, or even resurrect your fallen mercenary. More on that later. One tip people like to do is use the Haradra Cube not only to make various precious recipes, which are outside the scope of this overview, but to use the additional inventory space it provides within. Items can be of normal, grey quality and advancing up in rarity through magical, rare, unique, set items, even crafted. Unique can be potentially be some of the most powerful items and one can usually find them boasting high stats and attributes, but set items when combined to complete a set can offer some incredible bonuses. But there is one item in particular, one of the biggest loot loops players went through in the original version of the game, the driving force of many a discussion and a plague to all players alike who wished to hunt for such power. And that is, my friends, Rune Words. Rune Words are a complicated system which will have any min-maxer geeking out on websites, scouring for the best Rune Words, watching YouTube videos, anything like that for your character and build. Rune Words are an exact combination of runes to give an item exceptional attributes. Rune Words can be downright game-breaking in their power. Although each rune has its own attributes, one would be generally foolish to use them on their own and it would be seen as a much better choice to wait until you collect the rune word. And that could be the process of many, many hours of farming, waiting for that delicious orange text to appear on your screen and hoping it's one of the runes you seek. And there are many runes. And on top of that, there are many rune words as a result. All this talk about loot and difficulty modes, but are we not overlooking who does all of this? Who is responsible for progressing and collecting all of this? That's right, you. The player character. You can play the game online or offline, with people or without people, but some of the most challenging end game experiences you will need to play with people. Yeah, I know right? Playing with others. Jeez, what's this? Some sort of MMMORPG? Don't Blizzard already have one of those type of things? Final Fantasy XIV, right? Ooh, shots fired! <laughs> I digress. <clears throat> there are seven classes to choose from, five from the base game, two from the expansion. The Barbarian, the master of close combat and brute force jewel wielding specialist, combining various weapon masteries, combat skills and war cries. He can dish out the damage as well as take it. He gains resistances passively through a skill, making him valuable for late game. The Sorceress, your elemental specialist of fire, ice and lightning, easy to crowd control with chilling the enemy, capable of consistent damage with fire or bursts of high or even low with lightning. Teleportation is her strongest mobility. The Paladin, a champion of the light, fighting for good, using his blessed shields, hammers and heavenly strikes to vanquish demons and foes alike. He has an array of protective and offensive auras to buff himself and allies or even heal. Auras in general are constant, with no mana cost, so he can be very mana efficient. And like the Barbarian, can be extremely tanky, making him hard to take down. Best utilised, in my opinion, in multiplayer. The Amazon, a versatile fighter skilled with javelin, spear, crossbow and bow, and can combine magic to further imbue her power and protective abilities. And the Necromancer, the summoner of spirits of the dead to bend to his will and crush his enemies. He employs curses to weaken or mess with the enemy and bone spells and poison to all out damage. 
with the Lord of Destruction expansion, which is included in the remaster and can be toggled on or off, you can gain two additional classes. The Assassin. She relies on martial arts and the ability to lay traps. She can gain a lot of passive bonuses to aid her or focus more promptly on her stationary traps, which could deal elemental or physical damage. Martial arts and finishing blows focus on making her gameplay extremely fast. Why did I slow down when I said fast? <laughs> the Druid! Nature and shape-shifting comes naturally to the Druid. With nature he harbors and power of the earth and sky to protect him or deal powerful damage to the minions of hell. Something calls forth creatures like ravens, wisps, wolves and bears to aid in his fight. Or he can shape-shift into a werewolf or werebear to tear his enemies. Part. Which class you pick will be what resonates the most with you, or you can test out all of them, but be warned, the game hands you skills and abilities very slowly throughout, so you can't really get a feel for the character until you level up quite a bit, and trust me, that will require many hours of gameplay. Classes all have their strengths and weaknesses, and Vicarious Visions has kept the class balancing the exact same as the original developers left it. However, in an upcoming 2.4 patch, the first changes to classes ever since patch 1.13c, which was released back in March 2010, have been announced with an attempt to bring up underutilized skills to allow more build choice. And I think that is just fine. I personally believe there should be never a best build. You should always be able to have multiple so not everyone funnels down the same line. Why be the same as everyone else when you were born to stand out? Be unique, you unicorn. Every class has its own skill tree. Each tree, generally speaking, can only be increased by your character gaining experience and leveling up. There are some quests out there that will grant an additional skill up, which can be completed once per difficulty. Skills are inserted into the UI action bar, which has seen some small modifications between the original and remaster, particularly with showing your active hotkeyed skills above the main UI. This, in my belief, was a nice quality of life change. The synergy between skills can be key to mastering your class. And finally, with character creation, you can choose if you want to show off your character with red text to the masses, showing them you got big balls in hardcore mode, where a single death will be permanent and you will lose access to that character forever upon death. Imagine having a character that you have played for 100 plus hours and died due to internet lag or your younger sister saw your game and decided to play while you went to get some gainer fuel. Games for the gamer people. Or you can create a character on ladder play which is played in seasons which can offer their own unique rewards. Along with your player character you will have the option to select one mercenary to travel alongside you on your adventures. This mercenary can die like you, be healed using potions and generally can be very squishy. Unless it's an act 2 merc of course. And if you die they will automatically die. But don't worry they are not gone forever, simply pay some gold in town and they will revive, but these costs will add up. Mercenaries will play a large role in your battle against evil and can be equipped with multiple items and come with an assortment of abilities to help you. First things first, well, there were a lot of things before this core aspect was mentioned, but to kill the hordes of hell we need to be able to fight them, right? Each class feels very unique from each other, so playing any class, especially after the beginning levels, they will start to differentiate greatly. I decided to play Paladin as my first character this time round, as I hardly played it in the original. The great news is combat is unchanged between the remaster, however, that comes with some clunkiness of the original game's design as well. As mentioned before, you will be chugging potions a lot. You will be able to change them faster by inserting them on limited belt slot items, which can be expanded with some belt improvements. You will have a large amount of 
Your sparse inventory space overrun with potions and this constant bounce of your health and mana will feel very outdated with today's standards. One major change is that you can play with a game controller now, if you so wish, which can really ease the clunky design of swapping skills, which can be hotkeyed or clicked on to use. The controller speeds up this process considerably, which can make the game feel a little bit easier, but I believe as a player, a choice should be allowed and should not be snubbed. Who really cares how you play the game as long as you play it, right? You can also automatically pick up gold now as you run over it, which is a godsend as the amount of time you spent clicking each pile of gold really added up in the original. This can be enabled on or off if you want to keep to the original experience. Whether the team will add additional quality of life improvements or not may come in future game updates as they have been actively patching the game since release upon hearing player feedback. As a returning player or even a newbie to the series, you will need to get comfortable with the direction of your character. Some abilities such as the Blessed Hammer for Paladins takes a little while to get used to how it rotates and how it disappears if it hits an object such as a wall or fighting in narrow corridors uh, may put the ability completely out of use. Basic melee attacks and projectiles all must be targeted correctly and they will be a very slight input lag which is a more realistic way to see how your character takes any action. Unlike in modern games where you can practically parkour while shooting or attacking in melee. One thing the game gets so right is the feel to the original with how the combat pacing and feeling is. Progress is slow and deliberate, a constant fight for survival as enemies are gradually getting stronger as you progress through. You will feel this particularly in the opening hours as a difficulty curve is gradually felt. It is really, really important to immerse yourself in the experience that you are a lone hero taking on the legions the hell is throwing at you. Act 1 and Act 2 are the longest, taking you from the surrounding region of Tristram to the surrounding sands of Talrasha. The variety of enemies and particularly damage output is definitely starting to take place as you get out into the desert sands, where enemies never quite feeling like damage sponges but also not quite simply cannon fodder for the most part. There are some silly enemies in my opinion such as the fly swarms and the more troublesome enemies such as the high damaging vipers or the infamous death beetles. Act 3 takes a more linear approach as you leave the swarming jungles and set foot into the city of Kurost as we search for Mephisto. However, it still has many optional pocket dungeons to give variety. The game introduces some nasty new enemies to really make you second guess your tactics for the most part, such as exploding on death enemies, the fire wielding shamans, or even the council themselves can cause issues for some classes in particular. And still, to this day, I don't know why setting foot in hell in Act 4 is one of the most boring chores, when it should be some big, exciting, epic conclusion to the base game. It's really unremarkable and feels rushed. But that's not the remaster's fault, that is how the base game exactly was too. Only this time we have shiny new graphics to help us through it. We are literally taking the fight to the Lord of Terror himself on his home turf and although it is extremely chaotic in the ending section, in the Chaos Sanctuary, it is the shortest act with some of the most boring enemies outside of this and a bland environment for the most part. Thankfully this has kicked up a big notch with the much larger Act 5 which came with the original expansion on our journey to the summit of Mount Ariet to take on Bail. Death takes different forms of punishment in different games and in Diablo you will typically lose your gold and your corpse will lay where you died with your items intact. For any items not able to fit in the inventory slot on the corpse they will drop around the corpse. It is imperative you retrieve your corpse which may even require additional corpse runs. If you exit the game prematurely any item on the ground will be lost forever. However, if you know nothing valuable dropped, you could log out of the game and log back into the game and your corpse will appear in town. Sometimes this will be the better option. 
After I believe 15 or so corpses have spawned, your original will disappear and all the items will flood onto the ground. If you disconnect, the items are gone and you are left with nothing. Or if you play multiplayer, then someone can steal those items. Touching briefly on multiplayer, the more people you have in your team, up to a maximum of eight, the bigger the multiplayer enemies will have on their stats, but also can reward additional loot drops and more experience. This can also be set in offline mode in the settings tab if you want additional challenge. As touched on earlier in the video, one big factor to progression is not only claiming loot from your felled foes, but to complete each of the game modes. Each of the game modes beyond normal will cause different factors to appear in the playthrough, and not just the standard leveling up of monsters or make their damage output or defenses or health pools higher. In Nightmare in Hell, your character and mercenary will suffer big resistance penalties, making you more susceptible to enemy attacks. To help balance this, either class skills or wearing items with resistances can be useful, so having sets waiting in your stash as you progress can be a good idea. Both difficulties will add more possibility of variety of monsters to each location, increasing their levels, and some locations are increased in size and scope. Boss monsters will have additional enhancements, and particularly in Hell, immunities against specific forms of damage such as physical, lightning, fire, etc. will be tagged onto every enemy. And to make matters even worse, dying now not only causes you to lose some of your money as did normal, but you will also lose a percentage of experience required to reach the next level. Some of this penalty is removed upon retrieving your corpse, however you will never de-level. D-level? Is that even a word? Eh, maybe. Upon finishing the game in Nightmare, you will unlock the hardest difficulty Diablo 2 has to offer with Hell. However, for the brave comes the rewards, the spoils of war, with the best possible loot in the game. Also, there are rumours on the internet which have suggested that there was a lot of mooing coming from a portal which the prophecies state can be opened by a mysterious cube found under the desert sands, and if one could combine within its confines a leg of a worthless boy and a book containing rifts or portals or some nefarious demonic magic, something like that. But hey, <laughs> this is the internet. It's full of rumors. That's only speculation, people. Remember, there is no secret cow level. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, all of my demonic slaying unicorns, at the introduction of the video, I posed a question which asked, does Diablo 2 Resurrected still hold up to its original after two decades? And quite simply, the answer is yes. Vicarious Visions done a masterful job, masterful, in recreating the game from the ground up and the passion they brought is seen in every detail. This, my friends, is how a remaster should be done. Not half-assed like Blizzard's previous failure in Warcraft 3 Refunded. The team responsible took great care in its recreation and it just goes to show you can't just outsource everything and expect wondrous results. Stay a while in the realm of sanctuary, harden your weapons, shield yourself behind your skills and armor and prepare to take on the forces of hell once again. I wish you well, Wanderer, as you travel together into the East. Always into the East. Thank you for watching and remember to subscribe to see more videos in the future like this and a huge assortment of other videos to come in the future as well. And until we meet again, my unicorn, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Jamie out. Take care. Act 3 takes a more linear approach as we leave the jungle and set foot into the... Three, 